Would you like to know the most common reasons people fail their cloud architect, enterprise architect, or solutions architect interview? If so, this video is for you. In this video, we're going to talk about the seven most common major cloud architect, enterprise architect, and solutions architect interview mistakes that people make that keep them from getting hired. And here's the thing. There is such a shortage of cloud architects, enterprise architects, and solutions architects, and employers are screaming for them, but so many people can't clear the interview. So I want you to understand these mistakes so you don't make them because I want you getting hired. Now, I have personally interviewed over 6,000 IT professionals in the last 25 years. So I've got a lot of experience telling you where things go wrong. I've also spoken to thousands of other technology professionals, hiring managers, recruiters, and they all have the same challenges I'm going to describe to you now. So let's talk about the seven biggest mistakes people make. The first one is failure to demonstrate competency. Competency is the ability to do the architect job and do it well. Now, how do we determine competency for the architect? You see, architects don't build anything. We don't code, we don't configure. So the only real way I can check your competency is to talk to you for the most part. So I'm going to ask you a competency question and I need to be able to get an answer that's a reasonable answer that another reasonable architect in a similar situation would answer. So I ask architecture questions. I might ask a client, for example, or a potential candidate, could you tell me what goes into the security design of the demilitarized zone of, a, of where you would put a front end web application for a bank where the bank has mission critical uptime and 10 million users where security is uh, so essential. And with that, I'm looking to see, does the person know what a demilitarized zone is? What are the elements that go into a demilitarized zone? What are the architectural decisions you would make when you choose that? Or I might ask someone to talk to me about the key elements of business architecture and why from a digital transformation perspective, it's critical to optimize the business architecture before we look at the technology solutions or architectures. Or I might even get technical and ask the architect about, could you talk to me about the types of storage that are available to me in the data centers and the cloud? How do these types of storage work? What are the, store, what are the strengths and weaknesses of each type of storage? And could you provide some use cases and business benefits for each storage? So again, I'm answering these questions. Now, typically what happens when I do an architect interview, like a cloud architect or an AWS solutions architect interview, the person has no idea where to begin. And usually it's because the person doesn't know the difference between a cloud architect and a cloud engineer. And they learned a lot of hands-on skills like SQL or Python or Linux or Terraform or the command line interfaces of AWS and Azure, as opposed to learning architecture. So big difference between architecture and engineering. And if you study to be an engineer, you're not going to work as an architect. But that's a story for another day. And there's a lot of videos on this channel that you can see on what does an architect do and the skills you need for an architect. Now, the second biggest gotcha on a resume, and you wouldn't believe how often this occurs, is uh, the person can't explain what's on their resume. And I'll explain to you why this matters. So as a hiring manager and all hiring managers, we have to see a few things. Do we like the person we're gonna interview? Do we trust the person? And what has that person done in their career? What kind of mistakes have they made? What have they learned from their mistakes? Who are they? So. We use the resume, typically speaking, to guide our interview and guide our discussions. So what most people do is they put some of their most impressive things on their resume, which is great as long as the person can answer questions about that. And what we hiring managers do and say, well, we only have a small amount of time. So if the person's got 20 things on their resume, let me interview that person on the biggest, most important thing. Because if they can do the biggest, most important thing, chances are they can do the easier stuff. So that's what we do as hiring managers. We dive straight forward to the biggest, scariest, and most complicated thing that's on that resume. And we ask our questions. Now, here's the sad reality. I can tell you in over 90% of the interviews I've done that the biggest, most impressive thing on someone's resume, they have no answer for. They made it up to get the interview. Now, the problem is right then and there, the interview is over. You can't marry someone you don't trust. You can't hire someone you don't trust. And that's one of the reasons we ask this question. So do put things on your resume that look good, but put the things you can talk about and that you're good about. So don't make that mistake. 
Now, another really uh, big reason people fail the interview, especially, and it seems to be more frequently if they come from a hardcore engineering background or a hardcore math or science background or any background where the person's not in a position of communicating every single day, all day. Like some people talk all day, like salespeople and doctors and nurses, they have to communicate all day long. There are other people that part of their job is just being analytical and they don't have as much time to talk. So for the architect, that is going to present a problem and you're going to have to demonstrate strong communication skills to get hired because with weak communication skills, you can and here's why. For the architect, I don't know what you know. Architects don't touch the technology. They don't code. They don't configure. So I have to ask you questions. And how well do I know, how do I know you know BGP, for example? I ask you questions on BGP and the way you can explain it to me. If you can explain it to me simply, chances are you know it well. If you can't explain it to me or there's babbling or rumbling, I don't know what you know. And I automatically will think if you can't answer a question and you can't answer the question to me, you can't answer it to the customer, I can't hire you. So weak communication skills, I've sadly seen get some of the most technical experts and knock them out of architect interviews because there's that. Now, at the same time, for architects, we typically on an interview, we'll ask them to give a presentation. It's typically the last part of the interview. And we're looking to see that person's communication skills, their presentation skills, how they communicate, how they address the audience. So as a manager, we won't know what you know. We only know what you can explain to us. So explain it well. We think you're smart and know a lot. Explain it poorly and we think you're unqualified. So when it comes to explaining technology, here's the way I've explained it and I've taught it to others. And this is typically what works best for the others that I've taught it to as well. Explain the technology in terms of what is the technology? How does the technology actually work? And uh, what can the technology do for the business? And maybe even provide a few use cases. Now, there's some other very subtle reasons people fail the interview. And it's very subtle and it happens all the time for enterprise architects, solutions architects, cloud architects. And that's the way we demonstrate value. So in many cases, if a hiring manager interviews someone and the person just talks about themselves, like they're impressed with themselves, we tend not to hire the person. When we ask someone and they talk about their experience and then they show us what their experience can do for us and our companies, that's the person that gets hired. So the candidate has to demonstrate their value. It's not just what they've done. It's what they've done and how they can leverage that for me as the hiring manager and my company. That's going to be very critical. Now, the next one is kind of related to attitude. If someone walks in and they're shaky, hi, my name is Mike, I can't hire them. Because if they don't believe in themselves, well, I can't believe in them if they don't believe in themselves. And my clients are never going to believe in them if they don't believe in themselves. But what about someone that's overconfident or arrogant? Well, I can't hire an arrogant or overconfident person either. And here's the reason. Arrogant, overconfident people typically don't know what they don't know. And they overestimate their capabilities. And they make major, major mistakes. I also can't hire an arrogant person or a person with a bad attitude because they're going to destroy the energy on my team. And uh, I don't need conflict in my team. So I can't have any kind of arrogance because arrogance will create conflict in my team. Now, the next reason people don't make it through the interview is they don't come across as energetic and enthusiastic. And here's the thing. Employers want to hire someone that's excited about the opportunity. They want to hire someone that's in love with the job. Because when people do what they love, it doesn't feel like work. They work harder. They innovate more. They stay later because they're doing what they love. But if someone looks like they need a nap, or they really are tired and burned out and don't feel like doing the work, we typically can't hire them. Because the people that are most productive and typically the hardest working are those that love what they do. And to them, it's not work. I can tell you after 25 years of being a network architect, doing security architecture, cloud architecture, enterprise architecture, I don't consider it work. I love my architect jobs. But uh, that's the key is to me, and I was constantly learning, constantly growing because I loved it so much. Now, here's the next one, and I see more and more and more of it. And I'm going to tell you how to get what you want, but uh, not at the interview. So a lot of times people become very rigid and inflexible. 
So when I interview someone and I'm a hiring manager, I'm hiring someone to make my job easier and the rest of my team's job easier. We need someone to help us. And business is a very dynamic environment. The economy goes up, the economy goes down, there's new technologies, there's new things going on in the world, and business is constantly changing. So sometimes uh, there'll be periods where there's almost no work to do. Other times there'll be 12 hours a day. Other times my people might work five hours in a week. But when it comes to hiring someone from the hiring manager perspective, we need to know that our people are going to be there when we need them. Now, sometimes we interview someone and then someone says in the interview, well, I can only work these hours. I can only work in the office these three days because I must work this day and this day. And I can't do this and you can't call me on the phone. And the hiring manager says, I guess you don't want a job. So the key here is to be flexible to show the hiring manager that you'll adapt and move with them to the best of your abilities. Now, this is not the time to make demands in the interview. Go through the interview, convince the hiring manager how good you are, what you can do for them, why they need you on your team, and make them love you and desire you. Now, at that point, after you've passed the interviews and the hiring managers, once you're on their team and the company's made that decision, now you're in the position to say, you know, I would really like to do this, but I've got a personal challenge. Would it be possible to work from home on Mondays and Fridays in lieu of uh, whatever, something else? You might be able to negotiate it, but win first before you negotiate. Uh, and that will take you many, many miles on the, uh, uh, and very far in your career. So if you look at your cloud architect interview or your enterprise architect interview or your solutions architect interview as a sales call, you are there to show that you can do the job and help that client, that you're going to be fun to work with, that you love the job, that you're passionate about doing the job and being better. You're honorable, you're trustworthy, you've got stellar communication skills, and you'll do whatever it takes to succeed. Those are the people that we tend to hire. If you're looking to get your first job or get promoted into a cloud architect, enterprise architect, AI architect, solutions architect, security architect roles, please join us for one of our future architect webinars. The link is in the description of this video. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a like, uh, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell to be notified of new videos to assist us in your technology career. And maybe share this video with another cloud architect or solutions architect that you know wants to get their first architect job. This is Mike Gibbs signing off for now, and I look forward to seeing you in another video or a free webinar. Take care and talk to you soon.